Hello and welcome to a Chessama Chess. In the early 1920s, about 100 years ago, a quiet, humble, unassuming man invented a quiet, humble, unassuming opening that just recently, a hundred years later, helped Ding Lurin win the World Chess Championship. Chess players know this as the Collie system, but if we are very strict, we should call it the Coal system, because it is named after Edgar Cole, a Belgian player who was born on the 18th of May, 1897, and died at the age of only 34 on the 19th of April, 1932. And his good friend and fellow chess player, his colleague, Koltanowski, stated in various interviews that it is not pronounced Kohli, it is pronounced Cole. Cole was an excellent player, earning first places in tournaments, often ahead of strong contemporaries like Maroxi, Rubinstein, Tartakova, and even future world champion Max Erwe. Cole's playing career was cut short by ill health. He survived three difficult operations for a gastric ulcer and died after a fourth at the age of only 34 in Ghent. Hans Kmock wrote that Cole was Quote, not sentimental, he bore his sufferings as something quite private and of minor importance. He asked for no special consideration. He was always in good humor and a boon companion in company. But at the board, he was a relentless fighter guided by a really ideal sense of duty and sportsmanship. Sounds like a swell guy. Maybe this brilliant player could have reached further heights in chess if he hadn't died so soon. So let's learn about the Cole system. Cole's friend Koltanowski noted that besides being a deceptively simple opening, the Cole system, which he developed further after Cole's death, provided weaker players a really strong chance to not lose against stronger players. And I'm not a particularly strong chess player, and I'm sometimes lucky enough to play really good players, so I would sure love an opening that could help me not get uh, crushed. So, do you want to learn it with me? I invite you, come into this video and learn the Cole system with me. So, we will get into the Cole system that starts with 1d4. Using an example game played by Cole, the master and inventor of this system, himself. Against a lesser player, a master by the name of O. Hanlon, who played d5 in response. Cole played knight to f3, flexible move, holding back on stuff like c4 which would turn this into a queen's gambit. Similar flexible non-committal move, knight to f6. And here, in this position, Cole played a move that the Chinese player Ding Liren, who is now world champion, also played just recently. In this position, Ding Liren played pawn to e3, shocking the commentators. Not because this is flashy, not because this is a new idea, Cole invented it a hundred years ago, not because there is some amazing sacrifice or positional concept. On the contrary, my dear ASMR chess viewer and listener, this move is so quiet that it's almost as if white didn't do anything. Therefore, Ding Lorenz's opponent, Jan de Pomnishi, played c5, and that is also a hundred years earlier 
what O'Hanley played against Cole in this position. So Cole's little unassuming idea a hundred years ago traveled through time and was used by Ding Lorin to win the World Chess Championship in 2023. And when he won that match against Jan Nepomnyshi, the Russian, they were playing on a board that looked exactly like this. This is the World Chess Championship unique design. There is only one shop where you can get this, the World Chess Shop. And yes, I have a link in the description if you want these beautiful hand-carved pieces yourself. And yes, you will get a 10% discount. And yes, you will also support the channel if you buy a luxury premium chess set like this or indeed any product in the World Chess Shop. Here, Cole played pawn to c3. So what is this about? Let's first look at these two pawns here on d5 and c5. Basically, what black is saying, and this is the recommended way to play for black, what black is saying is, if you are not going to strike at the center, if you are not going to be ambitious, then I will. Usually, white is the ambitious side, because white has the first move, and the deeper you get into chess, the more you will understand how big of an advantage it is to go first. And here Cole played bishop to d3. We have now deviated from the World Chess Championship game, but a lot of the ideas used in that game will be seen echoed in this game, or rather Ding Lurin and Jan Nepomnyshi echoed a lot of the positional strategical ideas from this game when they played their World Chess Championship game, game 12. Here, O'Hanley played bishop to d6, starting a mirroring strategy. So what is, what is Black's argument here? Black is arguing that they must have the better position. Why? These knights are symmetrical. These pawns are symmetrical. These bishops are symmetrical. And these pawns are symmetrical. So the only thing on the surface level that breaks the symmetry in this position is the relationship of this pawn to this pawn. This one has a more passive defensive role, solidifying the pawn chain here, the little spear, the little pyramid into the position, whereas this pawn is further advanced, is threatening this pawn, and can also in some situations advance further. That is on the surface level. But there is one thing also that breaks the symmetry, and that is that it is white to move. White has the move. And that is a very subtle but very important distinction. Here, white played knight on b to d2. An idea also echoed in the Ding and Nepomnishi game. That looks like a good idea. Black says, I'll try to play that as well. So black plays knight b to d7. Still having exactly the same argument. We have the same position, except my pawn is better, therefore I must be better. Cole castled. Oh, Henley castled. And normally when I do these videos, opening videos, what I do is I study the games or the openings very, 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 very deeply in order to be able to give you, and you, uh, the audience, a very detailed explanation of the ideas 
experience and the narrative and the strategy. For this game, I have um, not analyzed it, I have memorized the game. Um, so I know all the moves, but I haven't spent a lot of time understanding everything. And I haven't analyzed it with the computer. Because what I want to do in this video is to invite you in to my world so you can be part of my journey learning this opening. This is how I usually learn openings myself if I want to employ them in my own game. I find some very sort of archetypal games uh, from uh, in that opening and then I play through them and I try without using a computer, I try to with my own brain understand what's going on. So we have this mirroring strategy that black is uh, trying to employ. What is white doing? White is saying you can't attack me. You you can only sort of mirror what I'm doing. Uh, if you and I'm, I have a very very solid position. I have these pawns. Look at this this pyramid here. They're all protecting each other. King has been safe the entire game. Is still safe here. So it's very hard for black to try something crazy. You know there is no real sacrifices available. There is no way to break this position open. So it seems that the strategy, the concept for white, as far as I can understand so far, is to get the pieces on good squares uh, using this triangle formation, get the king castled early, and um, have this bishop be very strong. And then I guess the future of this bishop is is still we are still having a question how we will make this a strong piece maybe that helps explain the next move which is rook e1 because of course what this does is it puts the rook on a potential open file so we are saying we are not trying to get this rook out with a pawn break by playing f4. No, we want to make a pawn break by playing e4. And that helps me understand also the role of this bishop here. Because if we are playing for e4, then of course this bishop will be unleashed as soon as we find a way um, to get this knight into the game. And the unassuming nature of, of White's play has uh, led O'Hanlon, I maybe I said I O'Hanley uh, earlier, his name is O'Hanlon, the player with the black pieces, has led him to believe that he can just continue copying. He plays rook e8. So we still have this symmetry going on with this pawn being superior to this pawn, but the very, very important difference that breaks the symmetry is that it's white's move. And here, white can play evil. And now the symmetry is broken and we will not see the symmetry again in this game. This is a huge threat. This is something that we absolutely have to deal with as as black because a move like pawn to e5 not only does it fork these pieces but even if we prophylactically move the bishop this advancement here would still be a huge huge problem um, we would have basically free reign to attack the king here so this forces black's hand he has to play pawn takes pawn on e4 and this little difference that white got in with e4 first uh, 
is actually a huge difference because now we as white can play knight takes on e4 like so so this knight that was on d2 being a little bit clumsy she was stepping on her sister's toes there a little bit and she was hemming in this bishop now this knight is springing to life also the knight is attacking the bishop that is not defended so O'Hanlin, not O'Hanley, O'Hanlin in this position played the very sensible move knight takes knight on e4 and here I guess we could capture with the rook but it doesn't seem that good because the rook will be hit after knight f6 we will hit the rook it will have to move maybe it could go here and it would be very strong but it looks a little misplaced is there any other reason why we are not capturing with the rook let's say a, a very ambitious move like f5 that kind of shots in this bishop a little bit but it does give us this backward pawn that could be subject to attack so i'm not convinced that it is not possible to capture with the rook it may be possible um, but cole played bishop takes which seems so much more natural to me and uh, we are also setting up for a very particular tactic that you may have seen before and that is something you absolutely want to have in your arsenal as a chess player, the tactic that is coming up here. So O'Han played pawn on c5, takes on d4. And I think he was probably expecting a recapture here. Then we would have an isolated pawn to play against that um, can be proven to be a weakness, the isolated pawn. And if knight takes pawn, I suspect we just play knight to f6, attacking the bishop. We have just an absolute perfect position as black here. All of our pieces almost are developed. We just need to get the bishop out. Um, king is safe. No problems. But uh, this quiet, unassuming man and this quiet, unassuming opening played a should we say a loud move a loud move uh, so what kind of tactic have we set up here the greek gift do you know the greek gift i have um, a video called the trick that won me 100 games of chess where i where i show how the greek gift was used by Italian player Greco 400 years ago in 1620 to win games back then and it is a thematic bishop sacrifice where you capture the h pawn if you're doing it against black it's the h7 pawn against white it's the h2 pawn pawn sacrifice the bishop by capturing the h pawn with check of course Black can just move out of the way, but you can then move back with the bishop if you want to, and you would want a free pawn, the king will be very unsafe. So that isn't a very, very big concession. So black is not going to do that, uh, except, um, except in very, very rare circumstances. Almost always the correct move is to capture the bishop. King takes bishop on h7. And here the thematic follow-up is knight to g5, saying check to the king. And now there is a huge decision to be made. Because very often the, the Greek gift is employed here 
doesn't win outright. Very often it can be defended against. And the crucial decision is to understand everything that's going on and figure out if you are going back to G8 or if you are going forward to G6. Note that we are not going to, um, to H6 here. First of all, now there will be discovered checks from the knight. The bishop, I mean, this check so the, the knight can help make this discovery. Also, we need to, in this particular position, we need to keep an eye on f7 because here actually knight takes f7, forks the king, hello, and the queen, madam. So that would be even worse. So the decision almost always, do we go back to g8, do we go forward to g6? In this game, O'Hanlon went forward to g6. And I think, I think the way that Cole handled that proves that going forward in this particular version of the Greek gift sacrifice, um, in this particular version, uh, doesn't work. It loses by force. And we will take a look at that. But first, let's just see if we went back here to g8. Can black defend against this? So the reason why you would go forward is almost always to have control over h5. So that we can't see queen h5 coming in here. We defend against that. If we go back to g8, queen h5 is the natural follow-up, threatening queen h7 check with devastating attack, also threatening queen takes f7 check. It's a dual threat. And what, how are we defending against this? Can, can black survive this? Let's, let's see, should black have played this or was there more chances going forward? Let's say we play a normal defensive move in these positions, f5. Now there is, there is no pawn to be captured here, but probably this doesn't work. Queen, check, we move, and I guess this pawn here will fall. We have only one defender, we have three attackers. That looks quite dubious. How about something simple like g6 that falls to check and mate? So how about queen f6 though? It brings a powerful piece to the defense. Defense f7 pretty well. Let's say check, king here forced, check. Now we can actually escape to this square. So queen f6 may be quite good. So queen f6. And if knight goes back to e4, forking the queen and the bishop, the bishop is undefended, but maybe a simple move like queen back, and there is no attack against the king anymore. And white did sacrifice a bishop, so I think this may hold. So I think, um, I think that in this particular position, in this particular version of the Greek gift, I think that it may have been correct to go back 
with the idea of trying to defend everything with queen f6. Let me know in the comments. Don't use an engine, just let me know if you want, if you analyzed this a bit, if you thought about it, if you think that queen g8 or queen g6 is offers the best chances for black and uh, and what your reasoning, reasoning is. I, I just absolutely love engaging with you awesome guys who watch this. Queen, uh, king to g6 was played. And here a very interesting idea, h4. Usually um, against king to g6, usually queen d3 is very good. That's something you want to keep in mind. But in this particular version, because we have relinquished so much control over the center, actually, I believe, Pawn to f5 defense um, defense adequately. Come looking at it though, looking at it, it may be the case that this pawn here is weak. So maybe queen d3 still works, but it 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 loathes me to allow f5. Even though we can come in and capture here, we are a piece behind as black. And as soon as we see knight f6, opening up this bishop, let's say we have captured here with a rook. Rook will have to move again. Bishop will help defend f5. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure this, this um, is good. h4, though, is very nice. Actually threatening check with the pawn and here now the rook went back to its starting square rook to a uh, rook to h8 um, trying to defend against pawn takes and let me just check because uh, let me check here on the computer because I think actually we saw sacrifice here I think we saw a rook sacrifice yep we did but it's not a real sacrifice. So we have the king on the run. We want to activate the rook, the queen, and the bishop to work with the pawn and the knight to checkmate here. So rook takes on e6. It's a very good move. That's check. You can't capture it with the pawn here. Not actually because knight takes, because it's not a fork, but because I think queen d3 now is completely, completely devastating. You can't go back, can't go here because of the knight. So you would have to either go here, where this fork wins the house, the queen, everything. And here, it does, it does look like there is going to be some devastating move here. Let me see if I can figure out what such a move would be. For instance, we could capture the pawn. Let's check. Let's say we do that. But then this bishop move may be annoying. Okay. Hmm. How about just very simply giving this check and checkmating because if you you can't go back because this is checkmate i guess this would also be checkmate um very soon we just have to open up for this bishop this is also winning so after this check we would have to go here and i guess there will also have to be a checkmate somewhere here um is this is not quite checkmate but it's really close this is also not quite checkmate checkmate again really close check here check and that is mate all right so can't capture the rook knight f6 instead and here we play check h5 check you can't capture that 
because you block out the escape square, so queen d3 is going to be checkmate again. <laughs> and the only thing you can do, except for going up here, where queen d3 or queen f3 is also uh, going to lead to a checkmate again, is to go to h6. And you can see this game is, is done. You could even just play knight takes f7, double check, attacking the queen, everything. So obviously white is winning here, but let's um, let's just watch the rest of the game. White played rook takes d6. So pretty simple idea is that if you recapture with the queen, I'm still going to capture on f7 and still going to check and win the queen. So instead, uh, we saw rather desperate try with queen a5 attacking the knight, but it's defended by the bishop, so it's not really a problem. Knight takes f7, double check, king back, knight back, check. You could repeat here. Uh, and then white would have to find a different way to win. But black went back to g8. And after queen g3, note, note that move, note that we have been going this way the entire game. But this diagonal here towards the king is also open. And after this move, black resigned. There is no way to, to stop this. If you try something like putting the knight in here, we can capture. You're not capturing with the queen because we do not want to uh, trade the queens. Remember, we have this queen over here, so we capture with the rook. Now, if queen takes, bishop takes, uh, if queen takes rook, then queen takes queen is going to be checkmate. You could say, what about a move like this? Actually, just check. check king f8 and checkmate so that's the video thanks to my patrons for supporting me thanks to all you guys all you guys out there watching these videos i hope you had a very good time and i hope you will try out the choral system and let me know if you like it i hope also that i will see you in the next video thanks for watching